Thank you for coming to our tutorial, Building an Open Source Observability Stack. Um, let's just introduce ourselves here. So my name is Hannah, and I work at New Relic, and uh, primarily on contributing to Pixie. Hi, everyone. I'm Michelle, and I also work at New Relic. I'm one of the maintainers of Pixie, and later I'll be walking you through the demo that we have at the end. Hi, I'm Vihang. I also work at New Relic, and I'm one of the maintainers for Pixie. Hi, everyone, and I'm Clemens. I am not one of the maintainers or developers of Pixie. I'm actually from VMware, and I represent more of one of you guys. So essentially, I am a user of Pixie, and I will walk you through not only open telemetry, but also how do we use these tools in one of the projects at VMware to show you kind of how to get observability and what to do with that data. All right, let's get started. So it's, it's super interesting, right? Um, there was a CNCF study last year where they were asking, what observability tools do you use and what are the challenges that you see? And more than half of the people said they are actually struggling with just the sheer volume of different tools that different teams are using. So this is a problem that we need to address, right? Observability has many, many different ways, many different things you can collect, many ways that you can collect and store and visualize and so on. And so part of what we wanna do today is really walk you guys through what is observability, how do you do this, how do you instruct, uh, instrument your code to detect all these things, how do you store them, how do you visualize them, just how do you get observability in your cluster? And Kate's is actually very specific in terms of observability because there's just so many open source tools. And we wanna guide you down a path of understanding what are the most common tools out there, which ones might be specifically interesting for your environment and how do you actually use them? So we first wanna walk through very high level, what are the tools? And then in the second section, Michelle, is gonna walk you through, all right, hands-on, how do I get this done? So one other thing that is super interesting is, you know, because there are so many open source technologies, you can ask yourself, okay, how do I avoid being locked into one? Because it is very, very tricky if you make wrong assumptions, wrong decisions early in your project to say, what if I later want to change something? Does that mean I have to rebuild my entire observability stack or can I just swap out individual pieces? Um, especially with closed source solutions, the lock-in could be very dangerous, right? Let's say you're locked into a specific vendor and the vendor increases prices twofold, threefold. That will be an issue that you have to deal with. So by understanding what are the different tools and what are your options, you can think forward and remain flexible. All right, so as I was saying, understanding this flexibility is super important. And let's assume you have an application and you have already instrumented your application to get uh, telemetry. So let's just say you do distributed tracing, which is awesome as we will see in you know, the rest of this, this, this discussion and the, the tutorial later, and you use Sipkin for looking at your distributed traces. You have a working end-to-end -end workflow, you visualize your traces, you can debug your system, everything is awesome. But let's say for whatever reason, you wanna switch, uh, switch away from Sipkin. So if you understand the ecosystem and you know what does SIP can, uh, SIP can do? What is the format of the traces that it receives? What other systems in the ecosystem does it work with? You can essentially say, well, you know, SIP can does distributed traces. What else is distributed tracing? Well, there is Jaeger, just one random example that could essentially replace one component and you essentially replug your end-to-end -end workflow to understand how do I get observability within my cluster? So, Again, understanding your options and knowing what open source tools there are really help you think forward, plan your system, plan your environment, your ecosystem. So I wanna take a step back though before we jump into individual systems, just like we talk about observability, but what does that actually mean in practice? So in my opinion, there's three main pillars of observability that you need to know about, which are logs, metrics, and traces. Probably all of you know what logs are. Essentially, it is a timestamp event of your system. Maybe your application emits literally a log line that says, hey, I have an issue processing a particular request, or your system streams for help, saying I just ran out of memory or something didn't work as expected. That is a log. A metric, on the other hand, is a numeric rep representation 
of something that happened at a particular a point in time. So for instance, what is right now my CPU usage on a particular Kubernetes node, or how many HTTP requests have I processed in the last 30 seconds, or how many messages are in my Kafka queue that I need to process. So metrics, very, very useful for observability, especially, as many of you probably know, for automatic scaling, for alerting, a queue that is too long is probably a problem, things like this. But it's not as clear uh, what are traces to some of you, maybe. Logs and metrics, almost everybody knows. Traces are slightly different. So when you think of a trace, you need to think of essentially a series of events, of events that belong together um, that show how one particular request is processed within your application. And what is important here is that a trace might be distributed. As a request comes into your load balancer, it gets processed by the load balancer, maybe by your uh, HTTP endpoint that might make distributed calls to other services within your application. And the trace encapsulates all the steps that are involved in processing this single request coming into your application. A span is one single event within a trace. So a span could be an individual API call that you make, or an individual query that you make to your database. Or it could be an HTTP request from one pod to another. And if you summarize all the spans that are re relevant to processing of your inbound request, you call that a trace. It's a combination of things. So here we have logs, metrics, and traces. And this is typically what we talk about when we talk about observability. So what we want to do very concretely today is we want to show you how do you now tackle these logs, metrics, and traces, possibly distributed, with open source tools, and in this specific case, actually four different CNCF projects. So we're going to be talking about Fluent Bit for logging. We're going to talk about Prometheus for metrics. We're going to be talking about open telemetry, which is really about metrics, distributed traces, and logs. And then finally, you know, us being from Pixie or working with Pixie, we're going to talk about the Pixie project, of course, uh, which also tackles metrics, traces, and application profiles. And what is actually interesting is that these are different projects in different stages of their CNCF lifecycle. So we have Fluentbit and Prometheus, which many of you might already be using. They've been around for quite a while. They're, you know, very... Um, mature projects, open telemetry, slightly uh, newer, and Pixie is currently a sandbox project, and we're working on making it, you know, uh, like advance in its CNCF uh, lifetime. All right, so first let's focus on logging and fluent bit. So what is the problem with logging in Kubernetes? Everybody knows logging, and it seems so simple, right? But there is this key problem that you probably all know if you've ever looked at the logs of a pod, and <laughs> there is an issue, and I just want to know more about it, right? So typically, first thing that I do, Kate edits deployment, and I increase log verbosity. And of course, now these logs are gone because the pod restarted and they're gone. So pods in Kubernetes, as you probably know, are ephemeral. So getting access to them and storing them outside of the pod is super important, but it's also difficult. Now, typically, when we have a Kubernetes application, we'll have 5, 10, 50 different applications you can be guaranteed that you'll have 15 different log formats because why, why standardize, right? So we need something that is able to, to be able to handle different logging formats. And also, I don't want to go to different pods to get the logs. I want to have one central place where I can see all the logs of my entire Kubernetes cluster. The problem with Kubernetes, as you probably know, is it's intended to scale massively, right? We could have thousands of pods on hundreds of nodes or even more. So logging has become a real issue in terms of performance. So whatever we do for capturing these logs, it has to scale massively. And so really what we're looking for is a lightweight logging solution. And actually we have one, it is Fluentbit. So Fluentbit has been around for, for quite a bit. And um, we'll talk about a little bit, you know, what's the difference between FluentD and FluentBit. But essentially, it is a system for capturing your logs, processing them, so you can have a standardized view. Now, I do not want to go too much into the details of the architecture of FluentBit, but I think it's important to understand what does it offer you? What can you do with FluentBit that allows you to say, this is the right solution for me? Maybe it's not for you, but you know, understanding what can it do helps you selecting Fluentbit maybe over Fluentd or some other log system. So at its core, Fluentbit really is a very plug and play architecture that has multiple stages that take care of your logs. So first of all, it's able to, to consume information from different sources. 
It can monitor your pods by integrating with journal D or using tail to capture logs, but it can get data from many different sources. It then essentially goes through a series of stages to process your logs. So it has a parser to make things uh, more, um, uh, more structured. So you know, sometimes you have logs that are simple log lines. What Fluent Bit allows you to do is say, I choose a particular parser that could be a regular expression to say, you know, I always have, let's say, the, the, the process name first, and I have a timestamp, and I have a PID, and so on, because that might be different in your different applications. So by having this parser step, it essentially brings you a structured metadata. Could also be a parser for JSON or for whatever else there is. Then it goes through a filtering step, because you might actually not be interested in all the, the logs of your application. So FluentBit allows you to filter, let's say, I only care about things that are Python processes from a particular node and so on. Typically, you would, if you can, capture as much as possible, but maybe in your environment, that's not possible. FluentBit allows you to do that. The interesting piece here is that filtering is not, actually, not only removing information, it can, only, it can also add information. So for instance, as I was saying, you know, we have the ability to get Kubernetes logs or pod logs by integrating with tail or journal D, it can actually, in the filter step, also integrate with Kubernetes API. So you will get metadata around a log line captured at a certain timestamp, belongs to a container, in a pod, in a namespace, and so on. So if you have rich metadata, that helps you. And then it allows you to buffer and essentially route your data. You might say, hey, if something has a particular tag, I want it to go to this log storage, or if it has another tag, it goes to another storage, or go to all of them if you have multiple, and so on. So it is incredibly, incredibly configurable, which makes it great to decide, you know, hey, is this for you? One thing that is very common and that we'll try throughout the presentation, but also later, later in what Michelle is showing you, is to help you distinguish between different projects that are out there. And one of the things that people ask very often is, hey, what's the difference between Fluent D, Fluent D and Fluent Bit? Aren't they the same thing? And it is confusing because they come from the same, uh, from the same source, like the same people worked on them. Um, and essentially you can say that Fluent Bit is a more scalable version of Fluent D, all right? So Fluent D excels as how configurable it is. It has tons of plugins for capturing data, outputting data, filtering data, and so on. They share the same underlying architecture, but Fluent D allows you to do much more of this. Fluent Bit, on the other hand, while it has fewer integrations, is incredibly scalable. So if you have a cluster that is incredibly large, we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of nodes, thousands of pods, maybe Fluent Bit is something that you want to look at. Fluent D, if you have very particular data sources, data parsing, data output needs, maybe Fluent D is more for you just because it is so vastly configurable. So that's the difference. Fluent Bit is just incredibly fast and kind of the, the new cool thing. So that's what we're going to be showing in the demo later. All right, we have talked about logging. Let's talk about metrics. So metrics, probably many of you might be using Prometheus already. So let's talk a little bit about Prometheus. It's clearly one of the most stable systems out there for dealing with large volumes of metrics. So we want to tell, tell you, what does it do? How does it work? Could it be for you? But like logging before, let's briefly talk about what is the problem even with metrics in Kubernetes? I mean, isn't that easy? So we already talked about pods being ephemeral and just having this massive amount of data that we have to capture, which is not only logging, also in metrics, a problem. So we need a system that scales really, really well. But what is also interesting is that there is this key idea of dimensionality of metrics in Kubernetes. So it's not just typically today that you wanna say, my application records this one value at a particular timestamp. You wanna be able to say, well, but I don't care about one pod, I care about Let's say I have a replicated set of pods that belong to a daemon set, to a deployment, to a whatever, that are just, you know, sibling containers. I want to know about all of them. So the idea that when you capture, capture metrics is we want to annotate them with metadata and do that automatically to say, well, give me the sum of all the number of HTTP requests processed for pods that belong to the same application. So we want to be able to augment the metrics as we capture them so we can later aggregate, filter using um, these metrics. And of course, we need centralized access, right? So we do not want to go to different places to collect information about different problems. We want to be able to go to one place and Prometheus or the ecosystem that the uh, open source uh, environment has been built around Prometheus that allows us to do exactly this. It's very scalable, very configurable, 
way to capture annotated metrics and have a centralized place to visualize them. So let's talk a little bit about how does Cook Prometheus work, because it will be very, very important for you to decide, is Prometheus for me? And even more importantly, how can I use Kubernetes, uh, how can I use Prometheus within Kubernetes to configure the data collection? I think the key thing you need to know about Kubernetes is at its core, it has two models of capturing metrics. One is the pull-based and one is the push-based model. Let's talk about the pull-based model because I think it's the more outlandish one, but the one that allows it to really, really scale. So the idea of Prometheus is it does not, so it does want to capture metrics by going to the individual pods in your environment and say, hey, tell me about all the, uh, all the metrics that you have to report. So what Prometheus does, it, you know, it uses a kind of a, 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 a service to say, what are all the pods that are available? And essentially goes and says, hey, tell me all your, your metrics. The reason why this pool-based system is so powerful is if you think of the opposite, where you have different applications pushing data to, uh, to Prometheus, you quickly run into this problem that you have different pods, possibly all at the same time, pushing metrics to this Prometheus instance, which is, of course, scalable. But if they all push at the same time, they might just take it down. So by having a pool-based system, essentially Prometheus can say, I know what is the best cyclicity or times at which I can go through the different pods and collect data when it works for me. The downside of this pool-based system is every single system that it talks to must have an interface. Could be an HTTP endpoint, something that allows it to pull information in some standard that it, that it supports, right? So Prometheus has a way that typically goes to an endpoint, does an HTTP request uh, to get the metrics in a specific format, parse it, and put it into its storage. But that implies your endpoints or your pods will have to have an endpoint from which you can fetch this. So if you have a closed source application which doesn't have it, the pool-based model of Prometheus might not be for you, but we have a solution for this, don't worry. Another thing that is important to understand about the Prometheus architecture is it is very configurable in terms of how does it store its metrics, right? There's different timestamp series databases, things that it could integrate with for storing data, but also for visualizing this data. Very typically, people use Grafana for visualizing things, which of course means that there's a query language underneath that you might be able to integrate with directly. But this is something that you will want to look into. And what's also interesting, very typically, you will want to have alerts from your Kubernetes environment, right? You want to be able to say, hey, if there's more than 10,000 elements in my queue, I want to get an alert. So alert management is also something that Prometheus can give you uh, by integrating with other solutions, but it's the probably nicest place in your architecture where you can implement this. So let me just very briefly, briefly talk about now, what if you can't do this pool-based model? Uh, and there's, as I said, uh, already one reason that you couldn't do that is if you have a closed source application that might just not have this endpoint where you can go and fetch the metrics, but there's other problems with this pool-based model. For example, if you think of very, very short-lived containers, so, you know, because Prometheus decides when to pull its data, let's say you have, I don't know, a Kate's cron job or something that runs for a millisecond. If Prometheus not right at that second when, you know, this thing runs, pulls the data, it's just gonna be lost. As I said, pause are ephemeral. So how would it get this data? So there is the model to also be able to push information to Prometheus, which exactly handles this case if you have very short-lived processes or if you have systems that do not allow an endpoint, or maybe it has an endpoint, but it's just the way your system is designed, you cannot access it. Think that there's this push-based model as well that might be able to un like circumvent that problem. So I hope by understanding the architecture of Prometheus, you have an idea of what requirements does it have? Very often this, this interface from which you can pull information um, and kind of how does it work? Is it for you? I think in very many cases it might be interesting to you, so definitely check out the details of Prometheus. It's an amazing system. Alrighty, so now we've talked about metrics. Now we want to talk a little bit more about open telemetry, distributed traces, and so on. And for this, I want to hand over the microphone. Ready? All right, so I'm going to talk about open telemetry, <clears throat> which is also called OTEL for short, if you've heard that. So um, one general observability challenge that we have is that there are a ton of options. So this is a picture of the CNCF open our landscape mode picture of all the observability monitoring tools out there. And the open source ones are shown with the white background and the commercial vendors are shown with the gray background. So you can see that there are just so many options for you to use. 
And it's possible that each tool here could have its own custom way of instrumenting your application to generate data, collect data, and export data. So this could make switching between observability solutions or adding a new one very difficult. So this is the problem that OpenTelemetry set out to solve. Now, what is OpenTelemetry? This is actually very confusing, and I hope that one of the main things you can go away with today is like a clear understanding of all the cool projects that are happening under the OpenTelemetry umbrella, because I think each sort of thing I'm gonna mention could be a project on its own. So at its core, OpenTelemetry is a collection of standardized vendor agnostic tools to generate, collect, and export telemetry data. So what does that mean? So first of all, it's a universal format for telemetry data, and that includes metrics, logs, and traces. Um, so that's one part of OpenTelemetry. The second part is that it provides client libraries to instrument your app. Um, so for example, you could have like Otel for Java, and um, OpenTelemetry provides ways to do manual instrumentation as well as automatic instrumentation. Another thing that OpenTelemetry has is an API for sending and receiving data in the OpenTelemetry format. Um, now this enables you to, collect, uh, to connect OpenTelemetry supporting applications and libraries together. And finally, what OpenTelemetry is, is the OTEL collector. And this allows you to receive, transform, and send data in the OpenTelemetry format. And this is useful because it gives you one single spot to collect and process all of your metrics. And then it's a single thing that has to talk to your storage solution. Now, one thing to note that OpenTelemetry is not, is it's not an observability backend like Jaeger or Prometheus. So um, I'm not gonna go into the implementation details of OpenTelemetry right now, but um, one thing I wanna, again, demystify is like the overlap between Prometheus and OpenTelemetry. And these projects are very interoperable. Um, Prometheus is at the current moment more widely adopted. It has an SDK for instrumenting your code. It defines a standard metric format, and it also has a backend for storage and querying. Now, OpenTelemetry is a newer project, and it also defines a standard, which is a superset of the Prometheus metric standard. And it also provides standards for traces and logs in addition. OpenTelemetry also has an SDK for instrumenting your app, but unlike Prometheus, OpenTelemetry does not have a backend. So that was OpenTelemetry. Now we're gonna briefly uh, discuss Pixie. And Pixie, as we discussed, is an incubating, or sorry, sandbox project. We just applied for incubating. And um, it is a newer project. And the goal behind this project is that right now, adding instrumentation to your app is very tedious. It takes a significant amount of time for you to set up trace and metric collection. Um, this is some example application code. And highlighted in red is the instrumentation logic and highlighted in green is the actual application business logic. And so it just goes to show that like instrumentation can take a lot of time to add. And so the idea is like, what if we could automatically collect some of this telemetry data? And I think that's where the observability field is going, one of the ways. Um, so, uh, and one way we're gonna look at this is using eBPF technology. So this technology allows you to dynamically program the kernel for efficient networking, observability, tracing, and security. So we're gonna talk about how Pixie uses eBPF for observability. But basically, at a high level, when you have um, Pixie deployed to the nodes in your cluster, it deploys these eBPF kernel probes that are set up to trigger on Linux syscalls related to networking. And so whenever any of your applications makes network-related system calls, such as send or receive, these eBPF probes can snoop the data that's being sent, parse it according to various protocols, and store it for querying. So the cool part, now that you kind of know how eBPF works, uh, the, like, the main point here is that you can use this new technology to capture full-body requests, network metrics, and even application CPU profiles. So I think the cool thing here is that the observability ecosystem has noted that like automated instrumentation would be the best way for people to instrument their apps. Well, not the best, but let's get like 80% of the metrics that we need off the table. Um, and obviously we need custom metrics still for very specific things that we're looking at. Um, so 
all of these projects are interoperable. Um, Pixie exports in the open telemetry format. So you can use all of these together to get both automated forms of telemetry and more manual forms for specific things you're interested in. So that was Pixie. Um, I'm going to hand it back to Clemens to discuss like what would this what this might look like in a real world use case. Thanks, Anna. Alrighty. So as I said in the beginning, I'm part of VMware. So I'm working on as part of the office of the CTO in a, an environment called X Labs. And so we try to build cool new stuff that is not yet part of a product, but thinking forward. You know, what will our customers, our users need down the line? And observability and security is clearly top of mind for all of you. I mean, that's hopefully why you're here. Um, and so I want to just very briefly talk about what we call Project Trinidad, which is what I'm personally working on, which uses many of these tools and technologies that we just talked about to solve a security problem. So I don't want to dive into the details. This is not a marketing pitch. But really, what we want to solve, essentially, let's automatically collect open telemetry information about your Kubernetes clusters and learn what is normal in your cluster in terms of security. So I want to know what are the pods, how do they talk to each other, what are the protocols that they use to talk to each other, and just understand what is normal. What are the APIs that are invoked from which types of pods? And what are the API parameters um, that are used, right? And so I can very clearly see there's certain patterns that, you know, how these pods are interacting and learn what is normal. And maybe one day, suddenly, one of your pods really misbehaves, talks to things that has never talked to before, invokes APIs that shouldn't be invoking, sets parameters that we've never seen in the past, and that could be a sign of an attack. Maybe one of your pods got compromised, and now there's an attacker maybe trying to extract data from your database and send it out to the internet. Clearly a problem. And the cool thing is, if you look inside a Kubernetes cluster, the east-west traffic is really very standardized, and when you have lots of data, very standard things, and you want to find outliers, what could be better than machine learning to do that, and that is exactly what we're trying to do with Project Trinidad. We learn automatically what is normal in your environment just to alert you, hey, there's probably a security incident if we see something that is not very normal. Now, we're using many of the tools that we've seen before, but essentially we deploy Pixie at the core of your Kubernetes cluster to collect a lot of information and get this in the open telemetry format and send it to a cloud. We use many open source uh, technologies. By the way, I'm presenting this just to kind of show you how even in your environment you could plug these things together in a very similar fashion, right? So we use actually the Streams, the operator, to automatically deploy Kafka for uploading data from the open telemetry collector, which is you know, supported out of the box by the hotel collector. And then we use a whole bunch of stuff. For example, we use Kubeflow, we use MLflow to essentially look at data which we store in Elasticsearch which the Jaeger tool can actually write for us, but directly taking it off of a Kafka queue, store in Elasticsearch, and we can use Kubeflow and MLflow to learn what is normal, and then we can perform inference to find out normal stuff. But, uh, and by the way, in the, in the end, we can even use the Jaeger UI to visualize what is going on in your environment and tag things that are not normal, right? But you can see, I mean, clearly maybe you don't want to do fancy stuff like ML for finding security relevant anomalies, but a lot of this stuff you can build yourself using all the technologies we've talked about today and just plug them together. So again, understanding the ecosystem, how things interact and understanding these formats and how you can you know, swap one for the other really empowers you to do a lot of very, very cool things. All right, I'm sure you all wanna get your hands dirty and see how does this work in practice, right? I see you all have your, your laptops open. So I would say, Michelle, walk us through how does this work you know, in a real environment. Okay, thank you, Clemens. So up on the screen, you see we have a QR code, or if you guys are more comfortable typing, you're feel, you should feel free to type out the URL as well. But this is basically a set of demo applications we've built on top of the open telemetry demo. And uh, there's a, a bunch of different steps, you know, setting up your cluster, there's deploying the demo application itself, and then walking through the dashboards and the data that it provides you. So uh, I highly encourage everybody to go check it out, but I also want to, you know, make note of the time that we have because we've actually seen, you know, as some of you may or may not know, Wi-Fi is very slow uh, at this conference. And so when we tried to personally deploy it ourselves, it took about 30 minutes. I was like, okay, we're not gonna have everybody sit there for 30 minutes while we do that. So what I'm gonna do instead is just walk you through what some of this data looks like to give color into some of the tools that you know Hannah and Clemens mentioned earlier. 
So when you deploy the demo applications, this is basically the flow of what you have. So first you have the demo application. I'll show you what that looks like in a moment. But from the demo application, we're collecting things such as metrics, traces, and logs. So the metrics and traces are actually going to be collected by OpenTelemetry using both auto instrumentation and manual instrumentation. And then we will have logs, which will be collected by FluentBit, which we also mentioned earlier. These will flow through to the OpenTelemetry collector. The OpenTelemetry collector will then send this data out to different data sources. So first we have Prometheus, which will be collecting your metrics. Then you have Otel or Jaeger, which will be collecting the traces and storing them. Then for the logs, we will be sending that from for the um, open telemetry format to Loki. And then at the end of that, we have Grafana, which is going to be pulling information from all of these different data sources and showing you them in the UI so you can make sense of what's happening in your cluster. Okay, so I'm going to actually change up the display because I will need to mirror this instead of splitting these screens. So just give me a moment. Okay, so if you follow through our tutorial that I linked to in the QR code earlier, you're gonna be deploying a few things in your cluster. We don't need to go into what all these different pods are, just know that there's a bunch of different pods that all do different things. Some will be for the purpose of the demo application. Some will be, such as you can see here, these are the Fluent Bit collectors. Um, there will be pods for Grafana and so on and so forth. So the next part of the tutorial is that in order to actually see all this stuff in a UI, you're gonna to want to um, port forward. So I'm gonna go ahead and run that. All right, great, so that's starting up and I'm going to open the Grafana UI. Or actually, let me show you the de demo application first. So this is the demo application that comes with the OpenTelemetry demo. This is a simple e-commerce application where you can basically just go and shop for a bunch of different telescopes. So you can click in, view the product, you know, add more things that you want to buy, add it to your cart, check out, so on and so forth. And uh, there's a lot of potential information that you might want to track here to make sure that you're always serving the best experience for your customers. So we can go ahead and go into Grafana to see what some of that data looks like. So with the demo application, we've also deployed a bunch of different Grafana da uh, dashboards that you can see here. We're gonna dive into each of these and see what you might be able to see about the demo application. So first we're gonna start with Prometheus or metrics. And you see here that, you know, there's a bunch of different metrics that you can gather. You can visualize them in many different ways. So for the top two, I can, let me actually zoom in to make it clearer. So you can collect things like system metrics. So a lot of this can be done, um, it can be auto-instrumented by open telemetry. So the top two are actually done through auto-instrumentation. You can get things such as CPU and memory that helps you figure out things like, you know, your program might be running a very long for loop, an infinite loop. You might have, you know, your memory continues to grow and you can find things such as memory leaks. Uh, you can trace or get metrics about your network requests. So you can see the latency of your different um, network requests, or you might be able to track the error rate. Here is a different kind of metric that I wanted to point out is the recommendations count. So as you may have heard earlier, there's many different kinds of metrics um, and custom metrics are ones that are specific to your application and the needs that you might have. So in this case where we have this e-commerce application where we make different recommendations to people about what products they might be interested in, you might wanna count how many recommendations that you're showing to people. You know, For example, this count goes to zero, maybe there's something that's broken in your pipeline. And so, to do that, you have to do some manual instrumentation. Uh, you can use libraries such as OpenTelemetry or Prometheus to do that. And then you can send that data over to OpenTelemetry and visualize that in a dashboard such as this. Next, we're going to look at logs. So everybody is pretty familiar with logs. Uh, I believe this has a lot of logs, so it's a little bit slow. But here you can see We've collected a bunch of logs across from all of the Kubernetes pods in your cluster. And 
the nice thing that Fluent can do, as Clemens was mentioning earlier, is you can add, you know, filters. You can add different processing to what you're collecting from the logs to add color to the data that you're collecting. So here, we've actually added, you know, what is the Kubernetes container that this log came from? You have the log itself, and you also have things like, you know, who is the person who exported it, what kind of log this is, was it standard out, standard error. Um, so, you know, you can get logs from across from all your different environments, all your different pods, and view them and filter them however you like to give you the most information about what's going on in your application. And then we will move on to our traces. Great. So here you can actually flip through different services. So you can find, you know, which trace was um, generated by which service. So this is currently on the feature flag service. I just switched to the product catalog service, which is responsible for showing the different products that you see on the Open Telemetry demo website. And so you can actually click into a trace. So this one you can see, this is following the get product request. And if we click in, you can actually get a nice view. This one's not as interesting, so I will click into a different one after. You can get a view of, you know, where was this request generated from? And so this started at the front end. So somebody hit the UI, they wanted to get the product, and that sent a request down to the product catalog service. And so we can click into that and also get more information about that request. So with OpenTelemetry or other tools, you can add different attributes to these traces. So at its core, a trace, you, you'll be, get, be able to get information like who's making this request, who's receiving that request, how much time is that taking, but you can also add your own custom attributes to give you more information about what's going on. So here, we're able to instrument this with what is the product name of the product that somebody tried to fetch, what is the product ID, and you can essentially add whatever information you might need that works best for you. And so some of these traces, let me see if I can try to find one, they can get pretty complicated. So this one, for example, right, you're able to trace somebody made a request from the front end that then hit the recommendation service, which then hit you know, the feature flag service, and so it helps you dive really deep into what's happening in your application, and what's really nice is that sometimes, you know, the customer's complaining, they're saying, hey, I'm hitting the front end, getting this product is really slow. And you don't actually know where in that pipeline because you're making calls across so many different microservices, you have no idea where that slowness is. So you can actually go and take visualizations like these and go ahead and see, hey, where is this taking a lot longer than I expect? Figure out which microservice it is and fix that and hopefully resolve that problem for your users. So I'm now gonna hand it over to Vihong who's going to talk a little bit about Pixie. Um, thanks, Michelle. So this is sort of what you get when you deploy Pixie. So as Michelle said, uh, with Pixie, you can um, collect all of this data uh, using eBPF automatically. Um, so this is uh, the same cluster with the open telemetry demo uh, deployed on it. And when you go to the Pixie UI, this is the kind of view you get. Um, straight off the bat, we can see that we have a service map. Um, the service map is created uh, by looking at all of the network traffic that Pixie collects using the eBPF uh, probes that we have installed. Uh, and we can then parse that traffic, compute stuff like latencies for it, and understand uh, what sort of services are running in your cluster and how they're talking to each other. So now, if we zoom in a little bit more, we can see the various uh, demo apps running in here. Uh, we can tell that there's like uh, Loki running, which is doing the logs processing part for Grafana. We have uh, a collector for open telemetry running, uh, and we have a bunch of other stuff like that. Um, let, let's dive a little bit deeper into the, the actual network traffic that Pixie's collecting. So the stuff that uh, powers this service map. Um, and so we can look at the HTTP data in this cluster. Uh, so you can see that uh, Pixie actually manages to collect uh, all sort of requests in the cluster. And if we expand one of these out, uh, we can see that we have all sorts of details for this request. Um, so you know, when you collect the network data, we have access for uh, the IP address that's making the request, the request headers, 
uh, the response headers and the entire body. Um, and then we talk to the Kubernetes API to sort of resolve these IP addresses and enrich it with the Kubernetes metadata to sort of understand which pods are talking to which other pods or services and so on and so forth. Um, note that uh, one of the cool things about using eBPF is that we can trace this data even if you're using MTLS in your cluster, uh, because we can uh, hook probes into the OpenSSL library uh, and capture the request and response bodies uh, before they're encrypted and sent over the wire. Um, so that's one of the cool things you can do with Pixie. Um, and then another, th another feature of Pixie uh, that comes automatically because of the fact that we can use eBPF to install these probes is the fact that you can get uh, flame graphs. So let's say you're uh, looking at different applications that you're running and wondering about performance and trying to optimize that, uh, and you need to know where the CPU time is being spent. Uh, Pixie can give you access to some of that. So let's look at one of the nodes in our cluster. Um, I can scroll down and you can see sort of like the entire uh, uh, CPU cores on this node being used and where all of the time's being spent. Uh, they get broken out by our various pods and the containers running in each pod. And then for any one of those uh, containers, we actually can zoom in further uh, and we get access to what the funk was actually doing at time of that uh, as part of that application. Uh, so this sort of information it's, uh, is why uh, we think eBPF is a cool way to collect some of this telemetry data, because uh, collecting these frame graphs and stuff like that, it's kind of hard to manually instrument uh, this stuff. Uh, and Pixie lets you sort of do this on an application when it's sort of, you might be debugging, something goes wrong in production, you don't have the time to add instrumentation, rebuild all of your apps, and deploy them to try to test it out again. Uh, with using eBPF probes, you can kind of get this sort of debuggability and observability into the stuff you're running uh, directly. So. All right, thank you, Vihong. So we wanted to open it up for any questions that anybody had about any of these particular tools that we mentioned about observability. I think Clemens and Hannah, if you'd like to join us back on the stage for that. Uh, also, I wanted to mention that if anyone's following along with the guide uh, and uh, you're trying to get everything deployed on your cluster uh, over this Wi-Fi, first of all, kudos. But second of all, if you need any help, if you run into issues, just raise your hand. One of us can help uh, help out, help, help come help you out. So. Yes, and we also wanted to say for anyone who is trying this at home and then maybe later wants support or wants to ask any questions, there's also the CNCF Slack. There's the channel, I think I believe it's called 2-kubcon-sessions. So we'll be monitoring that for any questions you all might have. All right, so are there any questions? You can wander around now, we'll just wander around. Oh, I, I see one yep, in the back. I should take them. Can you walk up? Can you walk up to the? Oh, okay. Up here. Thanks. Uh, my name is Balinder, and I'm a DevOps engineer. And thanks for this cool demo. Uh, I just have a question about this uh, setup, the storage. So all these applications you have uh, integrated together, <coughs> uh, in a very busy environment, how practical it is to um, to manage it, you know, on a daily basis, especially from the storage point of view and the actual usability point of view. I mean, this is very cool in a demo, but I just want to understand the storage part. Thanks. So are you particularly interested in the storage of Pixie or of all the other well, logs? Well, uh, all of them. The logs, Locky, I know that we can store, uh, you know, the, the Locky comes up with the store engine, engine, but I'm interested in if you have built this one as a one application, we still have to manage storage for all of them separately? So the, um, in this case, it's all stored in, in Prometheus, right? In Loki. 
Uh, so most of it is stored in Loki. So you know you okay. want to have a central storage because yes, you definitely do not want to have to manage all these different storage uh, systems. So yes, uh, Loki okay. in this case is like one place. In a very busy, uh, very very busy environment, uh, let's say, is it practical? Do you have this uh, running in in a busy system, or this is still under development or or beta, for example? So, I mean, the, um, the open telemetry demo, of course, is something that we use, right? So this is not something that we have deployed. Okay. But yes, um, I mean, this is used on a very large scale. So for our experiments, clearly, you will have, you know, dozens, if not hundreds of nodes in which you want to deploy uh, Pixie, for instance. Yeah. Um, and yes, there are issues that you need to look into the, the, the scaling, the storage. Yeah. I think it's really important because, like, one of the things that we talked about, right, is this, this architecture where you can say, what is important to you? Because I believe that just deploying and capturing everything is just not reasonable, right? Yeah. yeah so exactly. there is a lot of this, this, this thought around, okay, what is important to you to capture? Um, deduplicate, um, filter for the things that are interesting to you. Um, and actually the, the demo, when you do it yourself, you can see how you can have just config maps on your Kubernetes cluster where you say, what do you really care about, right? And actually right. one of the nice things that Hannah was talking to is the central piece of the open telemetry collector, which has several, ex so, we didn't talk about the architecture too much there, but the collector is actually quite nice, and that is also multiple components that can be launched in a sequence. So what you can actually say is that you have a collector, you have a batcher, yeah. and then you have a filter. So maybe in your case, you wanna use head-based sampling, you wanna use tail-based sampling. Um, for those who might not be aware, so head-based sampling is essentially when you get the f like when you generate the first span in your trace, you might wanna say, oh, this is coming from the IP that is always causing the issue, right? So you could say, I want that specific um, span. Right. I want that trace and all the spans connected with it. So when you create the first span, you decide, do I want to use it or drop it? Tail-based sampling is very different in the sense that it is done at the end of your processing and you can say, I wanna use, let's say, 1% of all my data, right? But so you might not have a lot of information like what is the, the, the most interesting one, yeah. but maybe having 1%, 5% might make use, uh, or may, might make sense to you. Um, batching, for example, in the, in the example that I was showing, we do collection on your cluster, but we wanna process the data in our cluster. Because, you know, the, setting up ML is not that easy, you know, talking from experience, Kubeflow and so on, you wanna have in the cloud shared across different clusters. And so uploading data, could be an issue, right? So you could say, well, maybe it's just too much or I need to batch it. So the open telemetry collector has this, this concept of batching prior to filtering. So you can do so many cool things by understanding how they work. So certainly when it comes to volumes, always think about batching, sampling, what is your sample strategy and so on. Right. So that's quite interesting. Okay. The other thing that, because you said, you know, like, are we talking open telemetry metrics? Are we talking Pixie? Um, and please, you guys keep me honest here, but I wanna uh, say that Pixie has this really, really neat solution that it's actually not something that you install in your cluster and starts to stream data to your backend. Because can you imagine the volume of traffic that we would exactly. receive, right? Yeah. So the idea of Pixie is that it captures data, stores it locally, and then you can, from the portal, go down into the, into the Pixie solution and say, hey, I want the HTTP request of the last five seconds, right? So you on demand go and say, what is the data that I need? And that is a very, very scalable solution, right? It's actually very similar conceptually to what I was talking about with Prometheus, where you don't want everybody spamming you at all times. You want to be exactly. in control. Yeah. And I think this is something, you know, if you think about the architecture forward looking, always keep that in mind. Where are the choke points? Is maybe the pushing the issue so you can turn it around to be pool based? Where do I do filtering batching? And just with Pix as well, right? Maybe you do on demand access. Um, so there's you know a lot of these conceptual problems that if you didn't think them up front, you'll have a very hard time solving them, right? But if you think up front where you say, oh, I, I want a collector that is able to filter later, and maybe today it literally copies 100% of the inputs into 100% of outputs. But you know, on that Saturday morning, 3 a.m., when your buzzer goes off that you have too much data coming in, that will come in very handy to just change one line in your logger and everything works better. Right, okay. Thanks. I, that was a lot of information, but yeah, that answer your question. No, my, my question was actually, uh, uh, you know, a, a complex one. I understand there's no one answer. But where I was coming from is the root. We want to get to the root cause. And most of the time, this information is just using up space and costing. We want to be able to use these filters, ideally, at the time 
of production. Consume it, not store it. Just store the analytics, massage the data, get what you want, as you say, which is, you answered my question, which is great, but uh, so filters and a bit of, you know, a bit of custom development maybe, and, and then we can uh, get the, extract that out. Yeah. And that, what's useful for us? It's all great, but it's the cost is always a, for us is a big issue. So uh, I'll be happy to <laughs> give it a go. Oh, 100%. Thank you. But I, I think really what you want, I mean, it's exactly what you said, right? You want to stream up the relevant information. So let's say a metric that will wake you up at 3 a.m. because you just have to. And then maybe have something like Pixie that says, all right, something is so wrong. Go filter, go deep and on demand. And I think Pixie, just its architecture allows you to do exactly that. It's an incredibly powerful solution. That's smashing. Thank you very much. Thank you. There's a question up front. Maybe you just want to use the microphone right next to you. So Hannah doesn't have to run around on the... Uh, <laughs> hello. Um, do you think it's a good idea that uh, showing clear text of a data that should be encrypted? Because yeah, with eBPF, we know that we can do it, but should we do it is an ethical question. Do you want to take it? Sure. Uh, yeah, this is, this is a great question and something that people are always concerned about. Uh, especially when you know you demo off something that says, "Hey, we can look at the clear text data, even if you ha use MTLS encryption." So we think about it in two different, a uh, couple of different ways. One of the things that Pixie does to sort of address the risk of having clear text data is the fact that it, it, the data that Pixie collects is stored only in memory within your cluster. It doesn't really leave your cluster. Um, when you query Pixie for the data. Uh, whatever querying you're doing, once it's filtered and aggregated, that final result does, call, does you know, set, get sent to the client, but that connection is also end-to-end -end encrypted. Um, however, eventually the, the answer is like, you know, you need to sort of evaluate the usefulness of that data. Pixie does offer some tools to sort of like try to detect and strip out PII from so, uh, such kind of data. So eventually you have to weigh, out, weigh, weigh the pros and cons of being able to get that data. And then, you know, maybe you don't want to use that uh, clear text data and you want to strip out the PII to try to say, hey, I want all of the other metrics. Maybe you want flame graphs and stuff like that, but you don't care about the network traffic. Hello, question about Pixie. I'm not that familiar with uh, eBPF, as, as in not in the use case that you showed here. You showed nice trace graphs, yeah? And do you have experience with multiple programming languages, how it, it could help? Because as I see it, I show it to my developers, and they can even uh, debug the optimization problems with the application, seeing what times, do what call spent, yeah, longest. But there are Java virtual machines, Erlang virtual machines, Python interpreters, and sometimes those trace calls don't go that deep. Mm -hmm. So what's your experience and in what language is it helpful? Yeah, I can talk about what sort of uh, Pixie can support and maybe if you have experience using it, you can talk about how you've used it. Uh, so out of the box, of course, uh, compiled languages are very easy. Uh, so as long as you have symbols in your binaries, uh, C, C++, Rust, and Go, that stuff is very simple to do. Uh, for uh, interpreted languages or languages with, with a VM, as you said, like things get challenging. Um, so we do have an, a solution for Java where we use an agent to actually get uh, flame graphs for Java uh, binaries too. Uh, and we are currently investigating what we can do from a Node.js perspective. Uh, but you know, given that the Kubernetes ecosystem has been heavily invested and like uses a lot of Go tooling, I think it really sort of works very well with the, the fact that most of the tooling that you use in Kubernetes is written in Go. Symbols are typically included in the binaries that are shipped. So uh, at least within Pixie, when we have needed to debug production systems, uh, the flame graphs have been super useful. Um, so, yeah. Just to add to this, I think there, yesterday was an also an excellent talk just specifically around eBPF. How do you stack walking things that you can do even in you know, interpreted languages and uh, stuff like this? So please, if you haven't seen that one, um, that would be interesting. Um, the cool thing though is Pixie and eBPF more generally, right? It allows you to capture data on multiple levels. So I understand, of course, that you know maybe the flame graphs might not be as complete in a Java or Python application, 
as in a, in a C application, but just the fact that we capture on a user mode as well as on a kernel mode level gives us a ton of visibility, right? If you think about networking, how are you gonna send a network request without going through the kernel, right? And that's just the beauty of these, these uh, kernel mode probes. And in our project, for instance, we actually mostly use kernel data because from there you can capture which process is talking, what other process. Pixie does this beautiful magic of resolving not only processes, but you know, which pod in what, or like which container in which pod in which namespace is talking to what other, other process on a different node automatically resolves that for you. And then by going deep into the payload, right, it parses HTTP for you, for instance, right? It supports several, um, several other uh, protocols, network protocols. You get a ton of visibility just by using the, the, the kernel mode instrumentation. And then yes, your you know, mileage may vary for user mode hooks might just not be supported for your application, for your library, for your programming language, but just on the mere system level, you get so much telemetry that allows you to debug most of the things that you will use or need for like finding the, the core of an issue. But you're right, it may vary depending on your use case. Thank you for a very complete answer. Any other questions in the room? All right, I guess. Yeah, we'll continue to hang out here for anyone who's following through the guide. Uh, so just kind of raise your hand, wave one of us down, and we can help you if you run into any issues. And if, if not, thank you for all the others for attending, and please do reach out uh, on the Slack channels that we were pointing out. Thank you.